One thing that data scientists will eventually do is create models for their data to help make predictions based on their algorithms. And that means training those models. In Azure, the most common strategy for training models is through the use of pipelines in Azure Machine Learning. Now, Azure Machine Learning pipelines are independent workflows that describe what needs to be done and in what order to achieve a desired outcome, usually a trained model. Pipelines can be executed in a variety of different ways. Now, these workflows or pipelines are broken up into a set of subtasks, and these subtasks are all considered steps in a pipeline. So let's talk about pipelines a bit. First, let's talk about the most common tasks that are performed in a machine learning pipeline. If the point of a pipeline is typically to create a model, then it stands to reason that you'll need data to do that. So one of the most common steps in a pipeline, often the first step actually, is data preparation. The data needs to be collected from whatever source or source is that it's housed. And a lot of the time, the data isn't perfect. And so that means that the data preparation step needs to clear out bad data, normalize data, add some calculated data, or whatever else you can think of to get the input data into a desirable state. Once the data is where it needs to be, the training environment needs to be set up. So the next step that's usually performed is to configure the system in preparation for model training. So that can be creating folders, creating scripts, creating runtime environments, setting up compute clusters, and so on. And once the training environment is set up, the obvious pipeline step is the actual model training. And that means invoking the appropriate algorithms, creating metrics, testing model accuracy, and so on. A lot of the time, the pipeline training step will actually repeat the training several times over and over to find the model with the best predictive performance. And finally, once the model is trained, the last step in the whole process is deployment. Deployment means to create a web endpoint that can be accessed by various authorized consumers. And these consumers would send in their own data, and your newly trained model would return its predictions. Now, each thing you do in a pipeline, each activity you perform, is called a step. Pipeline steps are independent modules that perform a single task, and they perform that task well. Steps have inputs and outputs. For example, a dataset step can be configured to collect a dataset from some source and then output it as a usable object. In fact, other steps can accept step outputs as inputs for themselves. Now, what that means is that steps in a pipeline can be interconnected. In fact, they almost always are interconnected. Otherwise, it's not much of a workflow, is it? But a key aspect of pipeline steps is that they're separate. They aren't dependent on other steps. Now, they accept inputs, and those inputs might come from other steps, but that doesn't make them dependent. That input can come from anywhere, even manually. A step takes an input, does its thing, and then sends out an output. That's it. So when you set about designing a pipeline, there are various sets of activities that you should probably expect to perform. For example, machine learning is tricky. If your goal is to create a model that can predict things, then you should be prepared to tweak your pipeline several times until you get something you like. For example, if you were to design a pipeline that attempted to predict whether a patient has diabetes, would you be satisfied with an accuracy rate of 50%? Probably not. So you'd tweak your pipeline to boost that number. So what if it was 80% or 90%? Whatever your threshold or success criteria, you'll have to tweak your pipeline several times until you get it where you want it. And of course, that means you'll have to rerun your pipeline over and over again. In an Azure ML workspace, that means creating an experiment for your pipeline and then recording runs within that experiment. Each run produces metrics that can help you see how each experiment improved or regressed based on your tweaks. Now, during the design phase, you'll also want to make sure that you select the right hardware for the task at hand. Typically, we're referring to the underlying compute needed for the work we're doing. So if you have a massively complex model training exercise, you might choose to allocate a big budget for a large compute cluster with beefy cores and lots of memory on each node. On the other hand, if you're just playing in a sandbox, you might only use some very simple clusters that don't cost you a whole lot, but take way more time. Now regardless, one thing you'll definitely want to design for is tracking metrics. Now there are lots of metrics you can get right out of the box, things like accuracy and AUC. And while you're training your model, those can be very good. But your model might have very specific success criteria for which you want to capture some custom metrics. 
Now you can create pipeline level metrics like how's my model doing, or you can even create step specific metrics if you want to. Now once you have a fully fleshed out pipeline, one last thing you might want to design for is the configuration of REST endpoints. Now this can allow your pipeline to continue to get executed by external consumers so that you can continue to get valuable runs under your belt with more and more data. Now another important aspect of pipeline creation is dependency analysis. Each step in your pipeline has dependencies. Now that can be in the form of required inputs, but it can also be in the form of needed software packages. Now remember the steps are independent and don't require each other, but as software modules, there are configuration and software dependencies that you have to handle. Specifically, you'll want to make sure that you figure out the dependencies between each step in your pipeline. If a certain step requires a data set, for example, then you'll need to make sure that that data set is made available at the right time for that step. And from the software dependency side of things, if a step that you're creating requires a certain Python package, for example, then you need to make sure that that package is imported. Now, figuring out those software dependencies is often referred to as calculating requirements. Now, that being said, it's important to only perform the required dependency calculations. Or put another way, you only want to import what you need. Importing packages can take time, especially if they need to be installed. So if you're blindly including various packages, you may be unnecessarily slowing things down. Now, earlier I mentioned that pipelines are run in what we call environments. And these environments are like little pockets of compute, a container actually, that executes the various steps. So it's actually these environments that have to have the dependencies installed and configured. Of course, it's also worth noting that each step can technically be run in its own environment as well. So if you happen to have a Python dependent step and then a C sharp dependent step, you might choose to run those steps in totally different environments so that you can optimize the dependencies in those environments. Now, lastly, let's talk about what the high level actions are after you've created your pipeline and you're set to run it. What does Azure ML actually do? Well, the first step is to go off and calculate those requirements. All the environments are evaluated and created. All the configured dependencies are pulled down and installed as necessary. The system itself is prepared for the pipeline execution. The next step is to assess the actual dependencies between the steps. So if a step requires output that's generated from another step, that relationship is understood and prepared for. So the train model step will fire after the prepare data step because the train model step requires the data set that's produced by the prepare data step. And finally, everything is executed. Azure ML will process the various nodes in an execution graph and all the steps will be run in the correct sequence in their associated environments. The output of the entire pipeline is then logged as a run in an experiment and all the associated metrics are produced. In other words, magic happens. In this demo, we're going to use the Notebooks feature in Azure ML Studio to run through a Microsoft sample that'll import data, create pipeline steps, and move data between those steps. And we'll do all of this using the Azure ML SDK. Now before we get started, it's important to note that this demo assumes that you have an Azure ML instance set up in Azure and that you have full access to it. If you don't, you'll need to get that provisioned first. You'll also need to have the necessary compute instance and cluster configured in ML Studio too. All right, so let's get started by heading over to the Azure ML Studio in our browser. Perfect. Now what we want to do in this demo is work through a Microsoft sample to walk us through the objective of this demo. But in order to use that sample, we need to import it into our ML Studio instance. So let's start by doing that. Let's head over to the Notebooks feature by clicking on the Notebooks item in the left-hand menu. Good. Now to import the Microsoft sample, we need to clone a Git repository into our notebook files. To do that, we need to issue a git clone command. So let's do it. Let's click on the terminal button above the file list. All right, now in the terminal, let's type the following command, git space clone space https colon slash slash github.com slash Microsoft learning slash mslearn dash dp100. Good, now this'll clone the Microsoft repo into our file list. So let's give it a second to complete. Good, now we can refresh the file list to see the cloned folder. Perfect, now we're ready to get started. 
Let's open the MS Learn DP100 folder and click on the 08 Create a Pipeline file. Excellent. Now, this Microsoft sample provides a step by step guide for creating a pipeline using the Azure ML SDK. And there's a ton of good information in here that'll explain each step in detail. And I highly recommend that you look over this for that extra detail. But in the interest of time, we'll go over this pretty quickly. And I'll still explain what's going on as we go. So let's start with the first block of code. Let's scroll down to that code. Good. Now in this first code block, we're connecting our compute instance to our ML workspace. Basically what we're doing here is we're authenticating ourselves so that we can do some work. On line five, we're using the from config method to provide authentication information that ML Studio already has. So let's go ahead and execute this code by clicking the play button to the left of the cell. Good. Now, if you happen to be prompted to authenticate, just go ahead and follow the instructions. All right, so let's scroll down to the next code cell. Good. So now that we're authenticated, we can start working on creating our pipeline. But before we can create a pipeline, we need data to action against, right? Well, that's what this code cell is doing. On line three, we connect to the default data store associated with our ML workspace. On line six, we upload some data to that data store. Specifically, we're uploading data about patients that have been tested for diabetes. And that data contains information about the patient as well as the result, that is, whether the patient was diagnosed as positive or negative for diabetes. On line 12, we create a tabular data set from those files. Then on line 16, we register the data set so that it can be used. So let's run this and create our data set. Perfect. Our data set is created and registered. Good. So now we're finally ready to create our pipeline. Or are we? Well, a pipeline consists of steps, and it's a little silly to create a pipeline that has no steps. Plus, this demo is about preparing the system for creating a pipeline. Anyway, let's scroll down to the next code cell. Perfect. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a folder to run our pipeline in. When you run a pipeline, you run it as an experiment. So what we're really doing is preparing our eventual experiment run. On line four, we're creating a folder based on a name given in line three. Pretty simple. So let's run this code cell and create that folder. Good, the folder has been created. Now let's scroll down to the next code cell. Now in this code cell, we're gonna create our first pipeline step. Importantly, what we're doing is creating a script file. We're not actually executing anything here, we're just defining the step. This pipeline step is gonna be about preparing our data for training. And notice on line one that we're calling the file prep underscore diabetes, and we're putting it into that folder that we just created. So let's take a quick peek at what this code is doing. On lines 10 to 14, we're consuming arguments that will be passed into this script. The two arguments are input data and prepped data. The input data argument expects a raw input data set and the prepped data argument expects a location to place the output data set. On line 21, we convert the input data set to a pandas data frame. And on lines 24 and 25, we get the total number of rows and log it as a metric. On line 28, we remove all the rows from the data frame that include any null or missing values. And then on lines 31 to 33, we normalize some of the columns using a min-max scalar. And on lines 36 and 37, we count the remaining rows and log that as a metric. And finally, on lines 40 to 43, we save the data frame as a file called data.csv in the output folder that was given as an argument at the beginning. Whew, that's a lot. So let's run this code cell and create the script. Perfect, the script now exists. So now let's scroll down to the next code cell. Now in this code cell, we're gonna create another pipeline step. And once again, what we're doing here is we're only creating a script file. We're not actually running this step. This pipeline step is gonna be about training our model using the data that we prepared. The important takeaway here is seeing how we can move data between our steps. In our first step, we prepared the data and then created a file that we placed in a particular location. In this step, we plan to use that file. So let's take a look at this code and see what it does. First, on line 16 to 19, we bring in some arguments that were passed into the script. Specifically, on line 17, we're given an argument called training data, which tells us the folder where we can find our needed data. In fact, on line 26, we load the data.csv file from that folder. 
and this is important. In our last script, if we had called our output file foo.csv, then this line would also have to be foo.csv. On line 27, we read the file as a pandas data frame. And on line 30, we define our features and labels. On line 33, we create a training data set and a testing data set by splitting our data into two parts. On line 37, we finally train our model. We're using a decision tree classifier here. On lines 40 to 49, we calculate our accuracy and AUC by running our test data through the model. And then we log those metrics of our experiment run. On lines 52 to 62, we create a chart to show our predictions and how they went. And notably, we store that chart in our experiment run. And on lines 66 to 68, we save the model to an output folder. And finally, on line 72, we register our model. So let's run this code cell and create the pipeline step. Perfect, the script now exists. So now we're ready to create and run our pipeline, right? Well, not quite yet. There's still a bit more prep work to do. Let's scroll down to the next code block. Good. Now for a pipeline to run, you need to run it through an experiment. To run an experiment, you need a compute cluster. So we need to reference our compute cluster. And this code block does that. On line four, we reference the name of our compute cluster. Now, if you don't have a compute cluster of that name, this code will try to create one on the fly. And if you do have a compute cluster with that name, it'll just create the reference. Now, I do have a compute cluster already, so I'll just change the name in line four to svdemo14cc. Good, and now we can run this code cell. Excellent, we now have our compute cluster reference. Now let's scroll down to the next code cell. Good. Now, when we run pipelines as code scripts, like we have, we need to execute those scripts in what's called an environment. That environment has all the necessary Python package dependencies our various steps need installed. But before we can create that environment, we need to define those dependencies. And there's lots of ways to do that. But one way is to create a YAML file that includes the list of all the dependencies. And that's what this code cell is doing. So let's go ahead and run this code cell. Perfect. We now have an environment dependency YAML file. Now let's scroll down to the next code cell. All right. Now, as I said, when we run pipelines as code snippets, we need to execute those scripts in an environment. And this code block creates that environment. On line six, you can see that we're creating an environment object. And notice that we're referencing the dependency file that we just created. On line eight, we're registering the environment with the ML workspace. And on lines 12 to 18, we create a run configuration that will be used by our pipeline and we configure it with our environment and the compute cluster. So let's go ahead and run this code cell. Perfect, we now have an environment created. So now we're ready to create and run a pipeline, right? Yes, but we'll do that in the next demo. I know, I'm such a tease. But in this demo, we collected data created and registered a data set, created pipeline steps to prepare data and train a model, and then created an environment that will be used by our pipeline to run an experiment. Excellent job. In this demo, we're gonna walk through a Microsoft sample notebook to create and run a pipeline using the Azure ML SDK. To do that, we're gonna piggyback off our last demo where we prepared our ML workspace with data, pipeline steps, and an execution environment. Okay, so let's get started. In order to do that, we need to head over to our ML Studio instance in our browser. Perfect, all right. So like I said, in our last demo, we prepared our ML workspace with some data that we'll need in the pipeline we wanna create. We also created the pipeline steps and an execution environment too. And we did all that using a Microsoft sample notebook that we cloned from GitHub. So let's head back to that sample now. Let's click on the Notebooks option in the left-hand menu. Perfect. Now let's open the MS Learn DP100 folder and click on the 08 Create a Pipeline file. Awesome. Now let's get started in creating and running a pipeline using the Azure ML SDK. Let's scroll down to the first code cell in the Create and Run a Pipeline section. Perfect. So let's dive right in and get familiar with what this code cell is actually trying to do. 
Put simply, this code cell is taking the script files that we created in our last demo and creating actual pipeline steps. On line 5, we're creating a reference to our diabetes dataset that we created and registered in our last demo. On line 8, we're creating a special object that's used as a temporary in-memory file location. Both the script files we created in our last demo took in arguments, and the data prep step needed an argument to know where to put the output dataset. The training step needed an argument to know where the prepared dataset was. That in-memory file location object satisfies those arguments. Now on line 11, we're creating our first pipeline step from our data prep script file. And notice on line 14 that we pass in our data set, and that on line 15, we pass in that in-memory location. On line 21, we're creating another pipeline step from our training script file. And then notice on line 24 that we pass in the in-memory location again. So let's run this code cell and create our steps. Excellent. Or the steps have been created. Now you're not going to believe this, but now we finally get to create and even run our pipeline. I know, finally, right? Anyway, let's scroll down to the next code block. Now on line 6, we actually create an array that includes both the steps that we created in the last code block. And on line 7, we create an actual pipeline object and pass in that array of steps. On line 11, we create an experiment. And on line 12, we create a pipeline run by executing the experiment with our pipeline definition. On line 14, we output the real-time results. So let's see this in action. Let's run this code cell. Okay, so now this code is spinning up our cluster, downloading data, prepping that data, training a model, and registering the output. The process may take some time to run, so I'm going to fast forward until it's completed. Perfect, our pipeline run is complete. Now let's take a peek at the output. All right, so you can see in the output that we logged a few things about building the pipeline, then creating the steps and executing the pipeline. Then we get our run properties, and that shows us details about the run and gives us access to logs. And if we keep scrolling, we see a workflow image of our pipeline. The data set is referenced, and we run a step that prepares the data, and then we run a step that trains and registers a model. Nice. Now let's scroll down to the next code cell. Now you might recall in our last demo when we were creating the scripts that we logged a few metrics along. So if our pipeline steps ran successfully, we should be able to see those metrics. So let's do that. In this code cell, we retrieve the metrics from the pipeline run that we just performed and output them to the screen. So let's run this code cell and see what we get. Nice! We can see the accuracy and AUC metrics from our training. We also see the raw number of input rows and the actual number of rows from our input dataset post-processing. We also see a link to an image. Now that image was produced while training the model to help show how the model performed. It's a bit tricky to visualize here though, so let's go see it. You don't have to just view this in code. Let's click on Experiments in the left-hand menu. Good. Now, as you can see, our experiment was created and it's listed in the center of the screen. So let's click on it for some more detail. Perfect. Now, this is a list of all the data associated with the experiment. It's not very exciting. What we really want is the run. So let's scroll down to the bottom of the page and click on our run. Excellent. And just like our code output, here we can see the actual pipeline rendering. Let's click on the train and register model step in the canvas. Good. Now notice that we have a panel on the right side of the screen. Let's click on the outputs and logs tab. And mine's already selected. Actually, let's give ourselves some more real estate here. Let's click on the expand arrow in the panel's title. Good. Now, notice in the output list that we have some image file down at the bottom. Let's click on it. Perfect! And so the image shows up in its own tab. This image is showing us our ROC curve. An ROC curve tells us how good our model is at coming to a correct answer. Now, because our model produces a binary result, this chart kind of looks funky. 
Because I know this data, I can say that the bulk of the patients in our input data set are diabetic, and our model correctly diagnosed them that way. If our curve was in the bottom right corner, it would mean that most of the patients in our input data set was not diabetic, and our model correctly diagnosed them that way. The point of this is showing us that our pipeline steps can produce graphs and other metrics that you can then consume this way. So let's head back to the notebooks feature. Okay, now let's scroll down to one last code block. Now in this code block, we're gonna output a list of all the registered models in this workspace. For each model we find, we output its name and version, as well as the way it was trained and any model level metrics that we got for it. If our pipeline really did execute properly, then one of the things it's supposed to do is register our model. So we should see it in this list. So let's run this code and see. Perfect! Our model has been registered and we have metrics. Fantastic! So there it is. Using the Azure ML SDK, we created pipeline steps from scripts, created a pipeline, executed that pipeline, explored output information and metrics, and even saw that our model was registered. All with code. Fantastic job. In this demo, we're going to walk through a Microsoft sample notebook and execute some code with the Azure ML SDK to publish a pipeline and call the publish endpoint. To do that, we're going to piggyback off our last couple of demos where we prepared, created, and ran a pipeline to train and register a model in our ML workspace. Okay, so to get started, we need to head over to our ML Studio instance in our browser. Perfect. All right, so like I said, in our last couple of demos, we created a pipeline that would train a model to diagnose whether patients have diabetes based on certain characteristics. And that process also registered a model. Now we did all that using a Microsoft sample notebook that we cloned from GitHub. So let's head back to that sample now. Let's click on the notebooks option in the left-hand menu. Perfect. And now let's open the MSLearn DP100 folder and click on the 08 create a pipeline file. And as you can see, mine's already open. Okay, now before we get started, let's quickly talk about what publishing means. Publishing a pipeline means that the pipeline is made accessible through a web endpoint. And that endpoint can be connected to by authorized consumers to execute the pipeline as it's defined. So what we're gonna wanna do in this demo is take the pipeline that we created in our previous demo and publish it so that it can be executed through a web endpoint. So let's get started in publishing a pipeline using the Azure ML SDK. Let's scroll down in the file to the first code cell in the Publish the Pipeline section. Perfect. Now, from a code perspective, publishing a pipeline is really quite simple. On line two, we simply call the publish pipeline method against our pipeline run object. We give it a name, a description, and a version. Now, that sounds pretty simple, but wait, what's this pipeline run object? Well, let's scroll up to the code block that we used in our last demo to execute an experiment. Good. Now notice on line 11 that we create an experiment, and then on line 12, we execute that experiment. What we're generating here is an experiment run, but that's synonymous with a pipeline run because we're executing the pipeline. So when we actually executed the experiment, we kept a reference to that run in the pipeline run variable. Now let's scroll back down to our current code cell. Now let's execute this code by clicking the play button to the left of the code cell, and this will publish our pipeline run. Perfect, our pipeline run is now published. Now let me pause here and explain one more thing. In our last demo, if we'd executed our pipeline run multiple times, that would have created multiple experiment runs or pipeline runs, and any one of them can be published, or all of them. In this code cell, we set the version of our published pipeline, and not all the runs are worthy of being published. But any pipeline runs that you decide to publish can be published in this way. And then, for each one that you publish, you can either give it a unique name or a unique version. So, if we'd run this pipeline again, maybe we'd choose to create a version 2. Anyway, back to the code. Let's scroll down to the next code cell. In this code cell, we're getting a reference to the endpoint associated with our published pipeline. Pretty simple again. This object is useful because it has a bunch of methods that we can use, which we'll get into shortly. But for now, let's just execute this code cell. 
Cool. So there's our endpoint URL. Pretty gross, isn't it? Well, that's why we have the object, so that we don't need to remember it. In fact, let's prove that. Let's scroll down to the next code cell. What we want to do is use our freshly minted endpoint and call our pipeline. But remember I said that the endpoint can only be called by authorized consumers? Well, what this code cell is doing is collecting authentication information from me. Then it'll build an authentication header that I'll be able to use to call our pipeline endpoint. So let's run this code to see what I mean. Perfect. The code executed and it got my current authentication information and then created an authentication header. If I wasn't logged in, the code would prompt me for my credentials. Now let's scroll down to the next code cell. All right, so in this code cell, we're finally calling our endpoint. Now remember that our endpoint is a link to our pipeline run. Now, as you saw in our last couple of demos, our pipeline run collects some data from an existing data set, prepares it, trains a model, and then executes it. So the important thing to remember here is that this endpoint is actually training a model versus using a model. What that means is that executing this endpoint actually creates another experiment run. On line three, we're referencing our experiment name. On line six, we execute our endpoint with our authentication header and experiment name passed in. Since an endpoint is run asynchronously, we should get a response right away. But we're given a run identifier so that we can track the work if we want to. So let's execute this code and see what we get. Good. So you can see that we got the response pretty quickly. Meanwhile, in the background, our pipeline is actually executing. So how do we know that it's working properly? How do we know when it's done? Well, let's scroll down to the next code cell. Now in this code cell on line three, we create a published pipeline run object and pass in our run identifier from our last code cell. We also reference the experiment so it knows where to look for the run. On line four, we tell the code cell to wait until the run is complete. So let's execute this code cell and take a peek at the output. Perfect. So here we can see what our pipeline did. It's still pretty gross, but there it is. Okay, so let's do one last thing. Remember that all we've done here is execute our pipeline again. And remember that our pipeline results in another experiment run. So if our endpoint operated as we expected, then we should see another run within our experiment. So let's check it out. Let's click on the experiments option in the left hand menu. Good, now let's click on our experiment. Perfect. And now when we scroll to the bottom of the page and see the list of runs, presto, there's another run. Fantastic. And so there you have it. We published our pipeline, we got the endpoint, we authenticated ourselves, and then we called the endpoint to execute our pipeline, add a run to our experiment. We then used the experiment view in ML Studio to verify that another run had indeed been added by calling our endpoint. Great job. In this demo, we're going to walk through a Microsoft sample notebook and execute some code with the Azure ML SDK to schedule a published pipeline and check details about the latest run. To do that, we're going to piggyback off our last few demos where we created a pipeline and published it to a public endpoint. Okay, so to get started, let's once again head over to our ML Studio instance in our browser. Perfect. All right, so like I said, in our last few demos, we created a pipeline that would train a model to diagnose whether patients have diabetes based on certain characteristics. We then published that pipeline so that we could execute it from a web endpoint. And we did all that using a Microsoft sample notebook that we cloned from GitHub. So let's head back to that sample now. Let's click on the notebooks option in the left hand menu. Perfect. Now let's open the MS Learn DP100 folder and click on the 08 create a pipeline file. And as you can see, I've already got mine open. So what we're going to do in this demo is we're going to piggyback off our last few demos to schedule our pipeline. So what do we mean by schedule? Well, that might seem obvious, but there are different meanings sometimes. In our case, we mean that we want to execute our pipeline on a periodic basis. In this case, we want to schedule our pipeline to be executed every week. So let's get to work. Let's schedule our pipeline using the Azure ML SDK. First, let's scroll down to the first code cell in the Schedule the Pipeline section. Perfect. Now let's take a look at this code block and see what it's telling us. On line four, we're creating a schedule recurrence object. 
and notice that we're setting the frequency to weak, and that means that we want the frequency to be based on a weekly frequency. Meanwhile, we've set the interval value to 1, and what that means is that this schedule is going to fire every week. Now, if we'd set the value to 2, it would mean that the schedule would fire every 2 weeks. Next, we have the weekdays parameter, and it's set to just Monday, and the time of day parameter is set to midnight. So all in all, this schedule is saying that we want to create a schedule that fires on Monday at midnight every single week. Now on line 5, we create an actual schedule object in the ML workspace, and we name the schedule, and we give the schedule a description. Now let's remember this description because it's going to be important later. The description is based on time. Now on line 7, we're actually referencing our published pipeline. The object we're using, published pipeline, is the object that we created in our last demo. We also reference the same experiment that we've been using on line 8. And on line 9, we tell the schedule object what our recurrence is by referencing the schedule recurrence object that we created all the way back on line 4. So let's execute this code and create our schedule. Perfect! Our pipeline is scheduled for execution. So now what? Do we wait a week to see what's up? Well, there's a few things that we can do here. So first, let's scroll down to the next code cell. Good. Now in this code cell, we're listing all the schedule objects that have been defined in the workspace. We've only defined one so far. So if we run this, we should only see the one definition. So let's run it and see. And there it is. It's not very exciting, but at least we know our schedule is defined. Now let's scroll down to the next code block. Now this code cell can tell us what our latest runs for our pipeline are. Specifically on line 2, we get the most recent run. We then output the details on line 4. Well, here's something I didn't explain before. When we define a schedule, the pipeline is run immediately, and then the schedule takes over from there. So we don't have to wait a whole week. Technically, a scheduled run should have happened the moment that we created the schedule. In fact, theoretically, the pipeline could still be running in the background right now. So let's run this code and see what we get. Cool. So here we can see the details about the most recent run. At the top, we see the run ID, and a couple of lines down, we see the start and end times. Now, if we scroll a bit further down, we can see a field called run type. Now perfect, we can see that the run type value is set to schedule, and that tells us that our schedule worked. Huzzah! Now let's do one last thing. Let's get a nice visual list of all of our pipeline runs so far in this course. Let's click on the pipeline items in the left hand menu. Good, now let's make sure that you have the pipeline runs tab selected, which I do. All right. Now what this list is showing us is all the pipeline runs that we've executed in this ML workspace so far during this course. In my case, I only have one experiment, so my list of runs is very small. But let's pretend I had a whole bunch of experiments in my workspace. So in the experiment filter above the list of runs, let's choose the MS Learn Diabetes Pipeline Experiment. Good. Now we're definitely only seeing the most recent runs for our experiment. Now notice the description column. Now remember when we created our schedule and it said that we needed to remember the description of the schedule? Well, here it is. This run has the same description of based on time. So let's click on the run. Great. Now we've seen this view before earlier in the course and that's good news. It means that our scheduled run looks and feels exactly like any of our other runs, except for one small difference. In the right-hand panel, let's scroll down just a little bit. Look at that! Notice that our runtime value is set to schedule, just like we saw in the code. Fantastic! So there you have it. We've taken a published pipeline, we applied a schedule to it so that it can run on a periodic basis, we used the Azure ML SDK to create that schedule, and then look at the list of defined schedules, as well as the most recent pipeline run. And we were able to visualize that information using the ML Studio. Great job!
Now, one thing that's important for a data scientist to accept and understand is that life with machine learning pipelines isn't all sunshine and rainbows. There are gonna be issues and you're gonna have to identify and resolve them. The good news is that there are some common errors that you can watch out for and prevent right off the bat. For example, one common issue is simply the inability to pass data to the pipeline's data directory. And the most common reason that's an issue is because the directory was created in a location that you didn't expect. So using the Azure ML SDK, there are objects that you can use to manage these folder locations and then simply pass that object around so you don't have to worry about these folders. Another common issue is dependency bugs. Now remember that when we execute a pipeline run, we do that inside an environment. And that environment needs to have the needed dependencies installed. So if you miss a dependency, as I have a million times, you'll find yourself getting errors because your script can't execute due to the missing dependency. Now, whether we're executing Azure ML code in ML Studio's notebooks feature, or executing pipeline runs in a compute cluster, sometimes we can run across ambiguous errors with those compute targets. Errors are happening and they don't seem to make much sense. Sometimes these errors are related to the compute targets themselves. And this is particularly true in compute instances where things can be run in the same environment. It's much more rare with compute clusters though. Either way, when these ambiguous errors pop up, it's often a simple matter of just restarting those targets. Another common issue happens when pipelines don't reuse steps. Step reuse is something that's enabled by default, and that allows improved performance when you rerun a pipeline. But if step reuse is on, and one of the steps has its own version of that flag disabled, then you can end up in situations where you get abnormal behavior and reduced performance. So let's keep it going with another common issue. One issue you can run into is that your pipeline is rerunning unnecessarily, and that ties to the previous point. If you have rerun disabled, which it is by default, yet your steps are rerunning anyway, then something isn't configured correctly. And one common reason for that is if the directory being used by the pipeline for its various steps is actually being used or clobbered by some other pipeline or steps, then when the pipeline goes to rerun, its folder suggests that an optimized rerun isn't possible and so it starts all over again. Now another common issue is that sometimes executing individual steps in the pipeline can be very slow, like unexpectedly slow, especially in the cases where loops are involved. Now, sometimes that's just reality, but other times this has to do with how information is being accessed. So for example, it's much faster to use a locally mounted virtual drive with all your data than it is to download it from a web endpoint for each iteration in a loop. And lastly, one more common issue is that the pipeline is super slow because the compute target is slow to start. Now, if your compute target has shut down, startup is simply gonna take time and there's not much you can do about that. Well, that's not true. There's actually two things you can do. One is to keep the target always running in some way so it doesn't shut down, like a keep alive poke of some kind. Another is to use a premium compute target with much faster startups, but both involve you spending more cash. All right, so those are the common problems. But what if you have an issue that isn't a common problem? What do you do to troubleshoot those issues? Well, the first thing that you wanna do is debug the individual steps. Almost certainly that's where your issue is coming from. Lots of times the problems are simply configuration, but other times it has to do with the input data. Regardless, you've got to look at your individual steps and debug them to see how they're configured or how they would handle certain data. It's also incredibly useful to use logging in Azure Application Insights. Azure ML Workspace transmit telemetry data like logging to App Insights automatically. You can view metrics, telemetry, performance information, and exceptions through App Insights. So if your pipeline is experiencing a problem, there's a good chance that the details about that problem have been captured right there. And one more thing you can do is use a remote debugger. Now lots of tools can be used to attach to a running deployment. And once you've attached yourself, you can set breakpoints in the code and try to assess what might be going on by inspecting the information coming in and what lines of code seem to be failing. Another potential strategy for troubleshooting your system is to use local script debugging. Now this is different from remote debugging because instead of attaching to your running system, you're creating your own local version and attaching to that one instead. And that gives you a huge amount of control. 
What it means is that you can attach your own custom debug configuration to that system. You can have the deployment configured in a very specific way so that you can get more information that would normally result in a much slower deployment. It also means that you're not going to affect any current implementations by mucking about in the production system. And once you've attached to your local system, you can much more easily inspect object state. So you can send in very specific data and watch each and every individual object in the workflow. You can assess how data is changed as it flows through the logic and where the state actually falls apart and why. Now this strategy can also help you identify type errors or even logical errors. Here's a common example. Imagine some JSON that includes a property called something like number of spoons. Well, let's say that the value of that JSON property was set to 10 and your code deserializes that into an integer. Well, then that's no problem, right? Well, now let's say that someone set the number of spoons property value to null. Well, in JSON, that's still okay. But if you try to deserialize that null value into an integer, then you'll get a type failure because integers are not allowed to be null. Finally, let's quickly talk about working with pipeline logs. Now, pipeline logs are extremely useful because you can see what's going on as the pipeline executes. In fact, it's most useful when you test your pipeline locally. Now imagine executing your pipeline in a system like Jupyter Notebook, or even on your own command line. All the logs would be output to the screen in front of you while the pipeline is executing. And the main way to do that is to employ the print statement in Python. The print statement outputs messages to the standard out, which can be captured and displayed on the screen. And importantly, App Insights also watches the standard out. So really, anything that you log using the print statement is automatically sent to App Insights as well. In this demo, we're going to walk through an example from Microsoft on how to deploy a model as a real-time service. To do that, we're going to train a model, register that model, and then deploy it. All right, so let's get started. Let's open up the Azure ML Studio in our browser. Perfect. Now, earlier in the course, we ran through a few demos that would create a pipeline, create an endpoint for one of our runs, and even schedule that pipeline to run on some periodic frequency. And we did all that by using a Microsoft sample that we downloaded from GitHub. In this demo, we're going to use another sample from Microsoft from the same repository. To access it, we need to head over to the Notebooks feature in ML Studio. So let's start by clicking on the Notebooks option in the left-hand menu. Perfect. Now let's expand the MS Learn DP100 folder in the file list and then click the 09 Create a Real-Time Inferencing Service file. Excellent. Now this sample from Microsoft walks through the entire process of creating a real-time inferencing service. There's lots of great information in here that puts some detail and context around each of the actions we take and I highly recommend reading over this in detail. Now that said, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go over most of this pretty quickly, but don't worry, I'll explain what each step is doing. Let's start by scrolling down to the first code cell. Good, now in this first code block, we're connecting our compute instance to our ML workspace. Basically what this is doing is authenticating us so that we can do some work. On line five, we're using the from config method to provide authentication information that ML Studio already has. So let's go ahead and execute this code by clicking on the play button to the left of the cell. Good. Now, if you happen to be prompted to authenticate, just go ahead and follow the instructions in the output. All right, so now that we're authenticated, let's scroll down to the next code cell. Perfect. Now, in order to deploy a model as a web service, you need to, well, have a model. And in order to have a model, you need to train a model. So what this code cell is doing is it's training a model and then registering it. In fact, let's go over specifically what this code is doing and what it means. On line 12 to 13, we create an experiment called MS Learn Train Diabetes, and we start a run. On line 18, we pull in some data from a CSV file and that data contains information about a bunch of patients that have been tested for diabetes. On line 21, we declare the features and labels from that diabetes data. On line 24, we randomly split the data into two sets, one for training and one for testing. On line 28, we finally train the model. Now here we're using a decision tree classifier, and we're passing in the training data set. 
The classifier algorithm makes sense because we're trying to determine whether patients are diabetic, 1, or not, 0. On lines 31 to 40, we test our model with our testing dataset and generate a couple of metrics, accuracy and AUC. On lines 43 to 45, we save our model. And on line 51, we register the model under the name diabetes model. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this so that we can train and register our model. Perfect, our model is trained, and we can see its performance based on the metrics printed in the output. Okay, so we've trained a model and we've registered it. Or have we? Let's scroll down to the next code block. Now let's pretend you've already trained and registered a model, or that someone else did. Maybe they ran some code somewhere else, or they used the ML Studio features to generate a model they liked. In our demo, we created the model on the fly, but clearly in real life, that's not always the case. What this code block is doing is helping us to see all the models that have been registered in this workspace. So let's run this and see what we get. Perfect! So here we have a list of models. Now you might remember from the demos that we did earlier in this course that we'd registered models then too. So we were dealing with the diabetes dataset then too, and what we did this time was actually ended up creating a second version of our model because we used the same name. Anyway, that's all the models that we have registered in this workspace. So let's scroll down to the next code cell. Now that we know the models in the workspace, now we want to get a reference to one of them. Specifically, we want to get a reference to our diabetes model. On line one of this code cell, we're specifically grabbing the model named diabetes model. And you'll notice that we don't reference a version. In the previous step, there were clearly two versions of the model. And this code will automatically select the most recent version of a model. So on line two, we print out the model that we got and its version. So when we run this code, we should see our model and that it's version two. So let's run the code and see. Perfect, version two. All right, let's scroll down to the next code cell. All right, so now that we have a model, we wanna deploy that model as a web service. To do that, we actually need to prepare the system. Each time our model is run, it should create an experiment run. An experiment run needs an environment to run in. So we need to create an experiment run environment. In this code cell, we're creating a folder for our experiment to run in. So let's do that and run this code cell. Good, now our folder exists. So let's scroll down to the next code cell. Now in this code cell, we're creating a Python script that will serve as an entry point for our model. So when someone makes a request to our model, this script will be executed to manage the user's request and response. So let's go over it so that I can explain. First, on line one, notice that what we're doing here is creating the script file. We're not actually executing this script, we're just creating the file. And the file will be put into the folder that we just created. On line eight, we create the initialization method for our web service. When the web service starts up, this method is executed. In this method, we load the diabetes model that we registered. On line 15, we create the run method for our web service. So when someone makes a request, this method is what's run. On line 17, we load the input data passed into the web service, and on line 19, we pass the data into our model to get some predictions. And the rest of the method converts the results into human readable output and returns it. Okay, so let's run this code cell to create the script. Good, the file exists. Now let's scroll down to the next code cell. All right, now like I said, in order to run a model, we need to run it as an experiment, and that experiment needs an environment, but an environment has dependencies. It needs to load packages so that our code can run in that environment. So in this code cell, we're creating a dependencies file that we can use to help create an environment and tell it the dependencies it has. So let's execute this code cell to create the dependencies file. Perfect, now let's scroll down to the next code cell. Now in this code cell, we're finally deploying our web service. On line five, we create an inference configuration object that accepts our environment and our web service Python script as arguments. We're also explicitly saying that our runtime is Python, and this is us defining the service. On line nine, we create an inference cluster based on that configuration. This is the compute needed to execute our deployed web service. Notice here that we're selecting a very simple number of cores and gigabytes of memory. On line 11, we're setting the name of our web service. 
And finally, on line 13, we deploy our model as a web service. And we reference the inference configuration from line 5, the inference cluster from line 9, the name of the service from line 11, and the model itself from earlier code. So let's run this code cell and deploy our model as a web service. Now the process of deploying might take some time, even up to 10 minutes, so I'm going to fast forward until it's complete. Perfect! Our model is deployed as a web service. Fantastic! So at this point, we've trained and registered a model, prepared a runtime environment, including setting how the inputs and outputs are handled, and we've deployed our model as a real-time inferencing service. Great job! In this demo, we're going to walk through a Microsoft sample notebook to consume a deployed real-time inferencing service using the Azure ML SDK. To do that, we're going to piggyback off our last demo where we deployed a real-time inferencing service to our ML workspace. Okay, so to get started, we need to head over to our ML Studio instance in our browser. Perfect. All right, so like I said, in our last demo, we deployed a real-time inferencing service to our ML workspace. That web service was configured to accept data about patients and then use a trained classification model to predict whether the given patients have diabetes. We did all that using a Microsoft sample notebook that we cloned from GitHub. So let's head back to that sample now. Let's click on the Notebooks option in the left-hand menu. Perfect. Now let's open up the MS Learn DP100 folder and click on the 09 Create a Real-Time Inferencing Service workbook see, I've already selected mine. Awesome. Now let's get started in consuming our web service using the Azure ML SDK. Let's scroll down to the first code cell in the Use the Web Service section. Perfect. Now, before we go too far in this section, let's actually write some of our own code first. Now, right above the first code cell in the Use the Web Service section, Let's move our mouse over to the left gutter and click the plus icon and select the code cell from the list of options. Good. Now we're going to add our own code here. Let's type the following code. print open bracket service dot state close bracket. Excellent. Now, in the previous demo, we deployed a web service and we kept a reference to that service in a Python variable called service. In this new code cell, we're going to check the state of the service and output the value to the screen. There's not much point in us doing anything with the service if it's broken. So let's run this code cell by clicking the play button to the left of the code. Excellent. So what we're seeing here is that the service state is healthy, and that's good. If the state is anything other than that, then we'd need to debug what's going on. That's what our next demo is all about. Okay, for now, let's go back to Microsoft's code block. In this code cell, we're actually going to call our deployed web service. So let's go over what we're actually seeing here. On line 3, we're creating an array that has a bunch of data in it. And this data corresponds to the characteristics or features of a patient. Our goal is to ask our model to predict if someone with these particular features has diabetes or not. On line 7, we convert that Python array to actual JSON. JSON is the format in which data is transmitted to and from our web service. On line 10, we call our web service and pass in the JSON data. And notice that we're using the service object to make that call. On line 13, we convert the response JSON back to usable Python objects. And finally, on line 14, we print the results to the screen. So let's run this code and see what we get. Nice. So according to this, our model has taken in an input data set about a patient with these particular characteristics and predicted that the patient is diabetic. Cool. All right, so let's imagine I had 500 patients or 1,000 and I wanted to test all of them. It might be a little crappy to have to make 500 or 1,000 requests to our web service. But notice that on line 3, our input data set was actually an array of arrays. So let's scroll down to the next code cell. Perfect. Now this time, notice that our input data set, defined on line 4, is actually an array that contains multiple patients. The rest of the code is more or less the same. We convert the input data set to a JSON object, we call our web service, and we convert the output back to a Python object. 
On lines 16 and 17, we iterate over the response and display the predictions for each of our defined patients. Okay, so let's run this code cell and see what we get. Awesome! So according to our model, our first patient is diabetic and our second patient is not. Cool! All right, so far we've been using a Python object called service to run these various commands. And that object is making use of the Azure ML SDK and actually connecting to underlying containers and such. In real life, consumers might actually only be able to execute HTTP requests against your service. After all, it's a web service, right? So let's change this up a bit. Let's scroll down to the next code cell. In this code cell, we're getting the HTTP endpoint that's been set up for our service and printing the value to the screen. Let's run it and see what it says. Perfect. So that's our gross but globally unique URI for our web service. Now let's scroll down to the next code cell. You'll notice that this code cell is virtually identical to the last run we made against our service, but there is a difference. So let's go over what this code cell is telling us. On line 4, we're once again creating an array of patients. It's the same array we used last time. On line 8, we're converting that array to a JSON object again. On line 11, we create a content type header that specifically tells our web service that the input is JSON. On line 13, we call our web service to make a prediction for our patients, but this time, we're not using the service object, we're using a standard Python requests object and calling the post method. So we're telling Python to make an HTTP POST request to the endpoint that we got in the last code cell. On line 14, we convert the JSON result back to usable Python objects, and then the rest of the code outputs the prediction results to the screen. So let's run this code and see what we get. Boom! Perfect! We got exactly the same result as last time. Fantastic! So that's it! Over the course of our last couple of demos, we trained and registered a model, we deployed it as a real-time inferencing service, and we called that service via both the Azure ML SDK and standard HTTP. Great job! In this demo, we're going to explore the various options available to us when we're trying to troubleshoot a model web service deployment. To do that, we're going to create a notebook file in Azure ML Studio and use the Azure ML SDK to collect some diagnostic information. All right, so one last time, let's head back to the Azure ML Studio in our browser. Perfect. So throughout the various demos in this course, we created some models that we used to predict whether patients were diabetic based on their characteristics. Specifically, in our last couple of demos, we deployed one of these models as a real-time inferencing service. You might recall from the deployment of the service that it took about 10 minutes to actually happen. So what if something went wrong during the deployment? What would we do to troubleshoot that deployment? Well, that's what we're going to find out in this demo. To do our troubleshooting, we're actually going to use the Azure ML SDK. To do that, we need to create a notebook. So let's head over to the Notebooks feature by clicking on the Notebooks item in the left-hand menu. Perfect. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to create our own notebook file. So at the top of the file list, let's click the Add button and select the Create New File option. Excellent. Now let's give our file a name. I'm going to call mine SB Demo 14. Now make sure to leave the file extension, otherwise notebooks won't know that this is a notebook file. Anyway, let's click the Create button at the bottom of the pop-up. Perfect! Our file is created. Now we can get started. Now when we use the Azure ML SDK, the first thing we always need to do is connect to an ML workspace. And this gives us access to all the resources in that workspace as well as authenticates us. So in the code cell at the top of our new file, we're going to paste in some code that connects us to the ML workspace. Now don't worry, we'll provide all the code from this demo. Perfect. Now let's connect to the workspace by running this code block, and you can do that by clicking on the play button to the left of the code. Awesome! We're connected and authenticated. Now if you get prompted to authenticate, go ahead and follow the instructions in the output. Alright, now let's create another code cell. We can do that by clicking on the plus button below our current code cell and choosing code cell from the options list. Good. 
Now what we ultimately need to do to really get us started is to get a reference to our web service. Now generally you'd already know the name of your web service, but let's pretend that for some reason you didn't know its actual name. So once again I'm going to paste some code in here and then I'll explain what it's doing to solve that problem. Okay, so what this code is doing is it's getting a list of all the deployed web services associated to the ML workspace that we connected to in the first code block. So let's run this code cell and see what we get. Cool. So we actually only got one web service, and this happens to be the web service that we deployed in the last couple of demos. Its name is diabetes-service. And now that we know its name, let's actually connect to it. Let's start by creating another code cell. Good. And now we're going to paste another piece of code in here. All right, let's go over what this code is doing. On line one, we're importing the Azure Kubernetes web service object from the Azure ML package. We need that object to be able to reference our actual web service. On line three, we're setting a variable that has the name of our web service that we want to connect to. So notice that it's the same value as we found in our last code cell diabetes-service. On line 6, we reach out and actually get a reference to our web service, and on line 7, we print out the current state of the service. And this will tell us how our web service is currently doing. So let's run this code cell and see what we get. Nice! Our service is found and it's healthy. Now that's great news for us, but there's always the chance that the service is not healthy. And if the service is healthy, you're good, and any problems you're having are probably related to the input. But if the service is unhealthy, you need to diagnose further. So let's just pretend our service isn't healthy. So how would we diagnose further? Well, let's start by creating yet another code cell. Perfect. Now in this code cell, let's run some code that gets us the logs associated to our service. Logs are good, right? So I'm going to paste some code in this code cell. Wow, this is pretty simple code, isn't it? All we're doing here is getting the logs associated with our service object and printing them to the screen. So let's run this code and see what it tells us. Wow, that's a big dump of text. And if we scroll through this, we can see all sorts of information about the deployment of our service, as well as its operation. And if we scroll all the way to the bottom, we see the most recent requests that were made against our service. Now it might not be super evident to the uninitiated, but we can see a POST request to the SCORE endpoint that resulted in a 200 OK response. Now that means our service is working fine. If it was failing for any other reason, the errors would be listed in this log file and you could potentially attempt to figure out what's going on based on that information. Now sometimes it's easier to troubleshoot a web deployment by attempting to deploy it to a local Docker container instead. Now let me show you. Let's create and paste one last code cell. Okay, so we're not actually going to execute this code block because it needs a bunch of other code to be written and executed first. But we can still go over what this code block is supposed to do at high level terms. On line 5, we're creating a local Docker container instance on this compute instance. And on line 6, we're deploying our model to that Docker container. Now that means we'd have to have inference information pre-configured, and we'd have to have a reference to our actual model so that we can deploy it there. Importantly, what this means is that we're not testing our actual web service, but rather deploying our model somewhere else so that we can test it from there. The objective in that case would be for us to validate our model and the various configurations associated with it and then assume that if there's any issue in the local container, it might be the same problem in the actual web service. And the rest of the code shows you how you would then execute requests against the Docker instance. And notice that it's virtually identical to running code against our actual web service. Now you could still run the same commands that we ran earlier in this demo, and notice that on line 6 we have a variable called docker service. This is the exact same type of object as the service object that we used earlier in this demo. So that means we could create more code blocks and execute states and logs exactly like we did earlier, just against the docker service instead. 
Now the reason the Docker method is easier is because it can be temporary and configured however you like without having to touch your current existing endpoint. Anyway, there you have it. If you have a web service deployment and you're looking to troubleshoot or investigate its health using the Azure ML SDK, this is one of the ways that you could do it if you're not going to investigate with things like Application Insights. Anyway, great job! So in this course, we've examined machine learning orchestration and deployment. We did this by exploring creating machine learning pipelines using the Azure Machine Learning SDK, importing, transforming, and moving data using Azure Machine Learning, publishing, triggering, and troubleshooting machine learning pipelines, deploying and consuming real-time services, and troubleshooting failed deployments. In our next course, we'll move on to examine model feature bias and differential privacy.